All right, folks starting to join us, we will get started in just a minute or so, just giving time for people to join the webinar before we actually start the discussion. Thanks for your patience. Okay, I think we're going to get started. I want to give us a little time. We had, I think, almost 900 RSVPs to this, and I want to give people a chance to get in the room. Um, I'm going to start off on the opening remarks, so people may miss that, but they can go back and watch in the recording. Um, good morning and welcome. I am Laura Friedman, President of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. On behalf of FMEP and Jewish Currents Magazine, which is co-sponsoring this webinar, I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar today, examining the proposition that the way forward for Israel-Palestine might well be a shared one-state reality. Why this is the case, what such a shift in thinking would mean to both Jewish and Palestinian Americans, and what such a future might look like for Israelis and Palestinians on the ground. To shed light on this topic, we are very happy to have with us today two people who really need no introduction, so I'll keep it brief, uh, Peter Beinart and Yusuf Benayer. Peter is a professor of journalism and political science at CUNY New York and a contributor to The Atlantic and editor-at-large at Jewish Current, a CNN political commentator, and a non-resident fellow here at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Yusuf is a non-resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington, DC, and a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Palestine Studies. So, um, and if you want more, you can find it online. Our webinar today will take the form of a discussion between the panelists and myself. In addition to my own questions, which have benefited, I want to say from thank you, the benefit, the, a number of ideas from friends and colleagues and people who sent us emails. Um, and then audience questions can also be submitted as always via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. We have 90 minutes for this webinar, which will hopefully let us cover a lot of ground, but I know it won't be nearly enough, so please be patient. Uh, also note the webinar is being broadcast live now and will be recorded so the video will be available online to watch again or share as you like. So with that, we are going to get started. Um, I wanna start with a scene setting round and here, Peter, I'm gonna start with you. So the immediate impetus for this webinar is the articles you published last week in Jewish Currents in the New York Times, making the case for a one state shared future for Israelis and Palestinians. I'm presuming people on this webinar have read both, one or both of those, so I'm, I'm not gonna ask you to rehash all the details, but I want to ask you as a starting point, why now? And by this I mean, you have long been a vocal advocate of the two-state solution. What made you change your own conclusion? I think over time, I began to feel as Israel entrenched its control of the West Bank more and more deeply, um, that the arguments that I was making were starting to feel less convincing to me. Um, it was not any a kind of epiphany, um, but it was a gradual process. You know, if you, uh, you know this, Laura, and maybe Yusef too, you know, if you write and talk for a living, you can kind of tell when your arguments feel right to me and right to you and when they feel somehow a little off. And it was just a nagging sense to me that grew stronger that, um, that I wasn't entirely convincing myself. I, I had no clear alternative vision, but I felt that, and I felt this in other times in my career too, that if you're right for a living, um, you can be wrong, and I have been wrong lots of times, but you can't write things, you can't have integrity and write things that you don't believe. Um, if you've come to a place where things that you were saying are things you no longer believe, you have to start again. You have to try to rethink. Um, and I've had to do that before in my career. Um, so I decided I would simply take a period of time to read, um, to read broadly about other historical conflicts that had, that had in divided or binational states that had ended with some kind of political system in which everyone lived together in equality, to read more deeply into the history of, of Palestinian and Jewish thinking on different state formations, to look at some of the scholars literature on alternatives to two states and gradually over time I felt like I began to see the outlines of something that would work for me the ideas were not original 
um, my piece is kind of made up of lots of different ideas that others have had before, including Yusef, who I cite in my piece. But I felt like I could try to make an argument that was framed in a different way by putting it in the context of Jewish history uh, and the history of Zionist thinking, particularly aimed towards a Jewish audience, and that that might help to move the conversation forward. Terrific. So Yusuf, following up on that, um, that's Peter's journey. Now, long ago, um, long before the talk about annexation, long before the Trump administration made it US policy to openly support greater Israel, you have been arguing that the two-state solution is not the solution or not even a solution. And the real solution is a shared state with equality for both Israelis and Palestinians. And you've written a lot on this. And I'm not asking you to rehash all the details here either. But to start things off, can you talk about why you have long opposed the two-state solution and why you have long believed that the way forward is one state? Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. Um, you know, I hear people often talk about, you know, uh, losing faith in a two-state solution, whether they believe in it, they no longer believe in it. And I've always thought this sort of idea that um, a solution is something that requires a degree of faith is a little bit bizarre. Um, a, a solution is a tool that you apply to a particular problem. And whether or not a solution is adequate for resolving the problem depends on what the problem is. Uh, and the, the way that I see it, and I know that not everybody sees it this way, but the way that I see it, and I think a lot of Palestinians see it, is that the, the problem is, is not, certainly for us, is not this identity crisis, this sort of midlife crisis that the you know, Israeli state is going through and trying to figure out, can I be a democracy and can I be Jewish at the same time and how do I resolve this? That's not the problem for Palestinians. The problem for Palestinians is what Zionism has done to Palestinians for over a century, right? And, you know, the two-state solution, as it has been discussed and as it has, has, as it has been put forward in every conventional form, is not a resolution to that problem. Uh, it, it might be a resolution to the sort of, you know, the, the midlife crisis of the Israeli state. Uh, because it, it puts off this, this tension between, um, you know, the reality on the ground and the, and the so-called values that, that it aspires to. But for Palestinians, you know, a two-state solution does not adequately resolve, again, in any conventional understanding, um, the uh, plight of Palestinian refugees, does not approximate justice for them in, in any realistic way leaves huge questions open as to the future of Palestinian citizens of Israel and what becomes of them. Um, and, you know, in the best case scenario, does not even result in real sovereignty for Palestinians in a, a new would-be state in the West Bank and, and Gaza and so on. So, you know, it may be a solution to somebody's problem. It's not a solution to ours and never has been. Um, and, you know, that, that's the reason why, uh, from, from my perspective, and again, I think from the perspective of a lot of Palestinians, this has never been an adequate solution uh, for, uh, for us. Great. So I want to I wanna pick up on that and go a little deeper. Um, so for decades, Palestinian intellectuals, including you, have tried to get the world to take seriously this idea that an actual solution is a shared one state. So, I mean, for literally for decades. Um, and I think my colleague will put into the chat a link that we have put, a resource we put together with links to the articles on this that go back and, and again are current. So given this fact, what is your perspective on Peter's articles, which have now sort of suddenly put the idea of one state front and center in the American Jewish and mainstream public debate? And, and more broadly, um, can you talk about the experience of Palestinians who have made the case for one state and how these ideas, when articulated by Palestinians, um, how these ideas have been received by American Jews and the broader public? Sure. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly glad that Peter has come to the conclusion that he has. Um, and and I, think, I think the answer that he puts forward uh, is the, the correct answer in terms of the way uh, to move forward, broadly speaking. Um, but, you know, as, as, as I tell my first grader when we work on math, uh, it's not just about getting the right answer, it's about how you got to that answer, and how you got to that answer matters a lot for how you move forward. 
because it's the principles of problem solving that are going to guide you through as you get to more complicated problems. Um, and I think here there is still probably a lot of space between us, and I think that matters. That matters um, in terms of uh, uh, resolving it to figure out how we get to the answer, how we implement the answer moving forward. And I think a lot of that is connected to the frustration that a lot of Palestinians feel in this moment, um, seeing the um, response, the important response, and the conversation that has been provoked by Peter's piece, despite the fact that Palestinians have been saying the very same thing for a very, very long time, right? Um, and, you know, we should be clear about the fact that we Palestinians did not invent the idea of equal rights. Uh, and in fact, long before our generation, there have been people generations ago discussing uh, this idea. Um, but there's a very clear difference in the way that Palestinians are heard compared to the way that um, people in the American Jewish community are heard on this issue. And I think that connects back to this original question of why do we get to this answer? Do we get to this answer because two states is no longer working or no longer practical? Or do we get to this answer because we understand that there's an injustice here that needs to be resolved that is fundamentally the result of a century long settler colonial process? that has worked to not only erase Palestinians and their voices on the ground, but also silence their voices in the debate about this here in the United States as well. I think these things are fundamentally connected and you know, to move this conversation forward, it's important that we focus on that piece. Thank you for that. Um, so Peter, picking up on that point, you've written and talked a lot about reading and listening and trying to see through Palestinian eyes and recognizing the dehumanization of Palestinians in the Jewish world and the larger intellectual space. So in that context, a number of people have asked me to raise what is a difficult question, which is, do you think progressive Jewish intellectuals and writers bear some responsibility for the marginalizing of Palestinians who spoke out against the two-state framing? I mean, in effect, is there a problem of gatekeeper, gatekeeping um, in effect, by, by making support for two states a progressive litmus test, um, in a sense, for legitimacy. And, and what do you think is our responsibility for trying to fix the fundamental problem of the marginalizing of Palestinian voices in a debate over their own future? So I think it's a really important and complicated question. And I think it's worth just acknowledging that you could argue that one of the additional, one force which has been marginalizing the influence of Palestinian intellectuals, the overwhelming number of whom, at least to I read, support one state, has been the PLO, right? I mean, the Palestinian national movement is expressed, in the P, as expressed by the PLO supports two states. The, joint, the leaders of the joint list in Israel support two states, right? So I think one of the things that has kept the discourse where it is, is you have for complicated reasons that Yusef understands better than I do. You have various forms of Palestinian leadership themselves that have endorsed and still endorse the two-state solution. And I think you see that their influence reflected in polling, which shows that in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, that you don't have a consensus in support of one state. You have rising support of one state, but um, we don't know what the polling in the diaspora would be, but you still have this, this you know, significant group of people who support two states. So in terms of, in terms of the role of um, uh, of American Jews in this in this conversation. There's no question that um, for various reasons that we and I enjoy a, a significant privilege that Palestinians don't have. And that for a very, very long time, the way this debate has been conceived in the mainstream media uh, and in Washington to degree has been essentially to pit a kind of hawkish Jewish or hawkish Zionist perspective against a more progressive Zionist perspective. And those have been the terms of the debate. Um, and I think that those, those debates have been dramatically limiting. I mean, I, I have literally lost count the number of times that I have told people in media institutions and in Jewish organizations that essentially that really is still a debate within the 50 yard of a football field. Um, and, and that essentially you're, you're cutting out 
um, a hugely important part of the conversation that needs to take place. There's literally, I have not given a speech in front of a Jewish organization in, in years and years and years that has not included the plea for that, that Jewish organization to end the de facto ban on Palestinian voices that I think is still largely the norm in Jewish organizations. So yes, I think this is something that is incumbent on all of us who have privilege to, to, to take it upon ourselves, to try to, to use whatever influence we have to, to change that. Um, and I think that it will not only be, um, I think all of, I think the American discourse will become a much, much more valuable, more interesting, more dynamic, more honest discourse, the closer we move towards that. I'm still muted, sorry. Um, great, so I wanna shift now to talk more about the substance. That's sort of the framing of, of this discussion or the, the context. Let's get to the substance a little bit more. Um, and I'm gonna start here, um, keep it with Peter. Um, so you wrote, I quote, today two states and one equal state are both unrealistic. The right question is not which vision is more fanciful at this moment, but which can generate a movement powerful enough to bring fundamental change. So. I have a question about this and I'm looking in the chat and the, the Q&A and I'm seeing people asking about this. So let's, let's hone in on this for a second. Can you talk about why you think the vision for a shared one state future can generate a movement powerful enough to bring fundamental change? And what does that movement look like? And, and in it, what should be the role of the Jewish diaspora? I think equality and justice are the fundamental, you know, visions that have animated the most powerful mass movements in recent decades around the world. I mean, whether it be the anti-apartheid movement or now the Black Lives Matter movement, which has shown, I think, in, a, with, in astonishing ways, the, the, the way a mass movement can change the boundaries of what is considered politically possible. One of the points that I make in my piece, just in passing, is that the notion of national independence per se I think is not as powerful a vision as it once was. Um, uh, and, and, and when you add to that, the point that I think Yusuf was alluding to, which is that in this case, in the, in the two-state solution as it's been generally conceived, it's not even really national independence in the sense that you're not even talking about a state which really has sovereignty. I think the, the notion of a kind of fragmented state basically largely under Israeli control it doesn't have the capacity to captivate people's imaginations um, around the world. Um, it, it's striking that, if, if, particularly in the United States, if you look at the polling, even though, as far as I know, Rashida Tlaib is the only member of Congress who supports one equal state, that view is already the preferred view of younger Americans, Americans under the age of 34, with essentially no legitimization from politicians at all, which I think suggests the potential power of this idea. It's not for me, uh, um, you know, living in, in, as a Jewish person living in New York, to say what this movement is going to look like. It will be obviously a Palestinian-led movement, and there, the, there, there are issues in the Palestinian movement that will have to be worked out. I would hope that they would lead to the end of the Palestinian uh, Authority, which I think has become a subcontract for Israel's control of the West Bank. I hope that the vision expressed uh, by Ayman Oda and others in the joint list, which I think is a very powerful vision, will be part of that. I think our role as diaspora Jews is to respond by embracing a vision of equality, but also finding ways of telling the story of equality and the story of justice in ways that, that, that create a Jewish language around them. That, that, that this is part of Palestinian history and part of Jewish history. And this struggle that, I, that, we, that needs to be created has to be situated within both of those histories. And we have to look for an authentic Jewish language to talk about why this is not only right for Palestinians, but right for us. And that was one of the things that I tried to start to do in my essay. Great. So turning to Yusuf, um, I'm going to quote you now. Uh, you have written, the time has come for all interested parties to instead consider the only alternative with any chance of delivering lasting peace, equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians in a single, Jew in a single shared state. So as a Palestinian, what do you think it will take to transform this idea into a movement that can deliver one state? And I'm seeing lots of questions about this in the Q&A. 
how do you see the role of BDS as a movement and as separately a group of tactics embraced by individuals on their own? Um, how do you see this bringing about change tangibly? Well, I think in here, I, I, I think I certainly agree with, with Peter on this. Um, you know, it's, it's people here in the United States and elsewhere, and it really is here in the United States where we need to see change for there to be change on the ground. Um, no, uh, no country's policy is doing more to sustain the status quo and making the status quo um, not just sustainable but preferable for Israeli policymakers than us here in the United States. And the reality is, you know, most Americans are not going to be animated to join a movement about what side of the Luelaja village the, the partition line is going to be, right? Uh, that's not something people are going to be able to identify with. Uh, or, or, uh, or, or really want to throw down as part of. Um, but the framing of equality is something that has mass appeal, something that Americans can connect to, not only in their own previous history of getting involved in international um, struggles, whether it's you know, in apartheid South Africa or elsewhere, but also in their own history, right? With the civil rights movement and, and so on, and the own, the own values that they, that they claim to uphold. So I think this, this framing has tremendous resonance and power and ability to actually create the kind of movement for change that we need to see here in the United States in particular, in the Western world more broadly, far more so the frame of uh, partition, and I, you know, I, I cannot disagree about the um, uh, role that the Palestinian leadership, um, I think, very unhelpful role that the Palestinian leadership has played in failing to realize this. Um, and I think it's imp it's important to point out that you know the the, the vision of a, a secular democratic state was actually the PLO's vision for a long time. Was the original sort of PLO vision prior to this shift toward two states. Um, and you know, two states was sold to Palestinians um, as a massive compromise and was only considered acceptable by those who considered it acceptable, which was not all Palestinians, because it was sold as a vehicle that would lead to the realization of Palestinian rights. But over the past, you know, 30 some odd years, it's become clear that that's not what it is at all. It's become instead a vehicle for maintaining the, the status quo for as long as possible. And I think when you look at those opinion numbers that um, Peter is, is, is talking about among Palestinians, you look at the Oslo generation, the generation of Palestinians who have grown up seeing this reality, this, this joke. Um, that's that's been played on them. Um, that's where the support for a a different vision really is, and I think that's the future. So you know, I, I obviously I think Palestinian leadership owes it um, to Palestinians to provide a different vision and better leadership, um, and this is the obvious direction. Uh, all that being said, um, there's lots of work for us to do here in the United States. Uh, before and until that happens, uh, because the status quo now is one of inequality, and we are supporting it, and we are maintaining it, and, and that does not have to be the case, and we can do something to change that by working here in the United States. Thank you. Um, so sticking with you, Yusuf, I want to move on to some a broader concept, which is the questions of equality, equity, and justice. And again, this is something that came up. A lot of people raised this and asked me to raise it with both of you. So for Yusuf, for the past 53 years, most of the world has viewed questions of Palestinian rights and grievances solely as a factor of the occupation. They talk about violations in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. But for Palestinians, resolving the conflict means addressing grievances that date back to the birth of Israel as a state. In this context, what in your view is required in a one state shared solution in terms of equality, justice, and equity? Are we talking here about decolonization, which I think you mentioned before, reparations, redistribution of wealth and resources, truth and reconciliation commissions, which I've heard mentioned usually by Israelis thinking it means something very specific that probably Palestinians would disagree with. And what about the question of right of return for both peoples? 
Yeah, and thanks, thanks for this prompt. Um, you know, I saw in, in um, after uh, Peter's piece was published, there was a number of reactions, including from some uh, Israeli and liberal Zionist uh, outfits who were critical of the conclusion. One of the things that they put forward as well, you know, there's there's such economic inequality between Israelis and Palestinians that the idea of putting them together in a single state, you know, would 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 not work. Well, wait a minute. Where did that inequality, that economic inequality, come from, right? Um, where where does the structured inequality that we are witnessing today, not just in the West Bank and Gaza, um, but the, the the inequality between Palestinian citizens of Israel and Israeli citizens, and the Palestinian diaspora and the Jewish diaspora, which of course has a immediate right to immigrate uh, the state of Israel at any point, whereas Palestinians uh, who may have been residents of the land prior to 1948 are continually denied return precisely because of who they are. Um, that, that inequality, that structured inequality is a product of over a century of settler colonialism. And uh, moving forward requires us first acknowledging that, understanding that, understanding how those processes developed over time, and then thinking about how we can reverse that in a way that actually not just leads to equality before the law, but leads to a more equitable society. Here in the United States, you know, we went through a, a, a massive civil war to establish the right to vote for all, for all people, a, a, you know, regardless of all men, regardless of race, right, in the 1860s. Um, and that didn't stop Jim Crow from happening. And then we had a civil rights movement in the 1960s and that still didn't stop institutionalized racism. And we're seeing that reality being protested day in and day out today. What I think we need to do in the case of thinking about a vision for Israel-Palestine moving forward is to learn a lot from situations where transformation has been tried and come up short. And I think this is one of the important lessons we can take away from um, South Africa, where you did see significant transformation away from apartheid, but not nearly enough was done to address the economic inequality that persists today. We need to understand what the genesis of that inequality is, and in the process of building a new future, establish very deliberate, calculated processes when it comes to refugee repatriation, when it comes to compensation for people who have been you know, forced into a different economic reality because of the policies, right? All of that has to be taken into consideration to be able to develop a future that is not just about equality before the law, but really a more equitable society writ large. I really appreciate that answer, and it actually anticipates the question that I want to pose to Peter. Um, so Peter, in your writing of the past week, you talk a lot about equality. You don't talk as much about equity or justice. Um, and as Yusuf has said, I mean, a lot of us who study South Africa, whether you not think that's a perfect analogy, ending apartheid in South Africa didn't dismantle the structural economic inequities, which today give rise to deep problems that continue to plague the country. Doesn't this suggest that a stable shared future requires not just equality before the law, but also some measure of justice and equity um, being achieved in a conscious way. And in this context, I wanna ask you about the part of your article where you talk about the idea that in a shared one state solution, Jews would actually preserve much of the privilege that they enjoy today. You, I think you raise a question about this. Um, so if you could talk about that. Right, and what I say in that, in that paragraph of the piece is that this, would, this, this will be a problem for a future uh, equal Israel-Palestine. If it goes the direction that we have seen, the template we've seen both in places like South Africa and the United States, just as Youssef was saying, that massive economic inequalities will be a, will be a threat to democratic, to democratic stability in the future because we, we know from political science research that, that vast economic equalities make democracy harder to sustain and more economically equal societies are ones that are more, that, 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 that are more likely to be sustainable democratically. Um, so yes, I think this is going to be a really, really, you know, history never stops, um, right? This, the struggles for, for justice and for, for equality never stop. So 
this will be a struggle uh, even the day after everyone in Israel-Palestine gets the right to vote. And I think that um, the way, what, what Jews need to recognize um, is that it, it is ultimately, uh, it, just as in, enlightened you know, white Americans recognize that massive racial inequalities in the United States um, are a form of privilege that ultimately doesn't serve uh, the United States well as a whole and therefore doesn't serve anyone in the United States well, that Jews will need to recognize that these inequalities, as you said, that have been created by a process of political exclusion and dispossession need to be remedied for the future health of the entire society. And, and so I think this is, again, this is a conversation that has you know, not really been part of the Jewish mainstream discussion much at all. But I think that those of us in the Jewish community have to try to bring this conversation more into the fore and, 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 and try to show and try to look for ways in, in models in which we can talk about remedying historical justice, not as a, not as a means of violence, and not as a means of Jewish dispossession, but as a means of of preserving, of, of, of making a shared society work for both people. And that ultimately that can be a form of liberation for Jews as well. I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in recent days is, recent days, is about the question of return of refugees and memory and the ways in which we as Jews in particular should be able to, 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 um, uh, to embrace that. Given, our, given how central memory and the notion of return is in our own history, that it seems to me a terrible, kind of, a terrible irony that we would deny other another people their right to hold on to a memory and see it brought to fruition by the chance to return to a historic home. Thank you. Um, by the way, I should have said before, you, Yusuf and Peter, you are welcome always to you know, hold up a hand and re respond to each other. You don't have to wait for my questions if at any point you, you want to. Um, Peter, I'm gonna stick with you. Uh, I wanna talk about reactions So to these ideas. So your article was clearly aimed at American Jews. And you said that it was framed to, to, to get American Jews to think about these things and it clearly hits the mark. Um, it has been especially striking to me, um, the challenge your analysis poses to many progressives who basically agree with most of what you're saying but are basically unwilling to, to really go to the logical conclusion and think the answer is to double down on, on, on a commitment to save the two-state solution. I want you to talk about that a little bit. And I also want you to talk about the fact, I mean, for me, it's, I think it's just incredibly ironic, the most hostile reactions to what you wrote seem to come from people who largely are part of the status quo defense of policies or promotion of policies that are actually antithetical to ever achieving a two-state outcome. Um, so can you talk about these kinds of responses, maybe the spectrum of responses as you see them and what, they, and what they say about the community, and maybe also a little bit about what you hope you will achieve or challenging and changing these um, coming out with the views that you have? Yeah, I think you're, you're right that in many ways the, the people who are angriest at me for, uh, you know, giving up on the traditional two-state solution, again, confederation, um, uh, which some have talked it, you know, can be seen as a kind of a two-state solution, but one that allows free movement between two states. The people who are, who are most angry for giving up on the idea of a traditional two-state solution, by and large, were people who never really believed in one in the first place. They were either explicitly opposed or they supported it in name, but were never willing to do anything to try to bring it about if that meant any conflict with the Israeli government. Um, so I, I think that what I hope is that we can have a, a kind of clearer debate, a kind of sense of where the lines of demarcation really lie, which is between one camp that believes in the idea of equality um, and another camp that um, I think we, I think it's up to us to, I think we, it's good for, for those folks to, to be prodded to be more explicit about the fact that their vision is of, of, of a vision in which millions of people lack basic rights. And I also think it's important that we challenge those folks to, to, to be honest about what they're going to do when, this, when the violence of oppression produces new rounds of uprisings and, and civil wars. Because I think one of the things that I suggest in my piece is that I think the logical result of this of this continued oppression and inequality uh, will be um, new uprisings that will bring 
kind of mass population expulsion more to the center of Israeli political discourse. There's already kind of smaller scale population expulsions that take place in Jerusalem and, and, and in, the, in the West Bank. But I think this is the kind of, this is I think the result of where the status quo is going. Um, for those folks who still don't, in the Jewish community, who still don't want to give up on the idea of two states, what I would say to them is look, I disagree with you, I've made my case, but I would at least hope that if you, if you want to hold to this two-state vision, that you would actually be willing to fight for, it, which is to say you would actually be willing to support forms of nonviolent pressure on Israel, whether it's conditioning American military aid or moves at the United Nations and other international institutions that would put pressure on Israel to change its course. Because I think if there's anything that we have learned in recent, in recent years, it's that an American policy that provides blank check support for the Israeli government to do whatever it wants will, lead, will, will continue with exactly what we've seen, which is further and further Israeli entrenchment of this unjust status quo. Thank you for that. Um, Yusuf, so I've been thinking about this a lot. I, over the weekend, this is a hook. My, so my friend Salam, uh, Salam Barame, who I think you know from the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy, he tweeted out a, a quote from a webinar he, he was doing. Um, and the quote was, and I'll read it, the opportunity to define a new social contract between the river and the sea where everyone is free and equal. He said, this moment brings us that opportunity. And for these words, a right-wing pro-Israel group in the UK accused him of using, quote, a progressive euphemism to advocate for the end of the Jewish state. And we've all heard accusations like this for years. Uh, effectively suggesting that Palestinian calls for freedom and equal rights are tantamount to an attack on Israel. It's a stealth form of, of Israel hatred and anti-Semitism. So how do you answer these arguments? I mean, I know you've been answering them for years. How do you answer them today? And how would you address those who espouse this kind of thinking um, in a constructive way in, in terms of not just telling them they're wrong and probably racist, but trying to change it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because it also echoes a sort of uh, far right sort of white nationalist conspiracy theory that's often directed at Jews themselves here in the United States about being sort of these subversive cultural Marxists who are trying to hide behind progressive ideas uh, to destroy, you know, a, a white America by bringing in refugees and, um, you know, supporting crazy things like feminism and equal rights and all of that. So. I, I don't think that I don't think that criticism is 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 worth a whole lot, um, and I think you know if 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 you are supporting a an ideological system uh, which faces some sort of existential threat um, from equality or democracy, um, then you, you know it, you you probably need to you probably need to think about that a little bit. Um, I, I think that's more of a more of a problem than anything else. Um, but you know, my question to the people who are serious critics of of, uh, of this, or critics in good faith, uh, if, if they are out there, um, is how how much longer of of the situation as it is are uh, you willing to countenance? Are you willing to support? Are you willing to pass by? until you come to the conclusion that Peter has come to or that others have come to long before. Is it gonna take another 10 years of this, another 20 years of Palestinians being shot by the Israeli military or uh, another generation of Palestinians growing up in refugee camps? At, at, what point, at what point are you willing to reflect and realize that this project is just not defensible? Um, and, and I really hope that people who are still holding out, you know, on, on the, the, the sort of the two state vision or dream or whatever, ask themselves that question. Because, you know, the two state solution has been quote unquote dying for as long as I've been alive. Um, you know, uh, Maron Benvenisti at the time said it was five minutes to, to midnight in the early 1980s, you know, are, are, are we willing to be, you know, are people who are still defending this idea waiting to be 30 years down the line of continued human rights abuses against Palestinians from Peter Beinart the way that 
Peter may have been willing to wait 30 years after Benvenisti, right? This is the question that, that I think supporters today really need to put to themselves and ask, how, how much more are they willing to defend to support a fundamentally unsustainable, unjust project? Can I just jump in, Laura? Um, because I, I think Yusuf's asking the right question exactly, and I would, I would phrase it differently, because I think that the truth is that it's not that people are clinging to, the, are, are, are reluctant to give up on the idea of the two-state solution. They're reluctant to give up on the idea of, of a Jewish state. And the reason they're reluctant to give up on the idea of a Jewish state is because they're reluctant to give up on the power that a Jewish state provides. Because for, for, for many, many Jews around the world, more, more, older, more than younger, but still for very, many, many, this notion of power, you say privilege too, but I think it's conceived of as power, is the antidote to the Holocaust. It is the, it is the guarantee that such a thing will not happen again. It is, the, it, is the, it is the insurance policy for the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. This power is what protects us. And I think the conversation that we need to try to start to have more in the American Jewish community is a recognition that power and safety are not actually the same thing. That, that there is a way in which power, and power I'm, not, I'm not arguing that Jews should be powerless. That is not the point of my argument. And I'm not arguing that Jews don't have the right to think about our own collective and national self-interest, not at all. But I think that there is power when it is abused can stop being a form of a, a means of safety and can actually be a means not only of terrible brutality and oppression towards others, but can actually bring about one's own nightmare. Right? And this is something we've seen in oppressive reality after oppressive reality, which is to say, you brutalize people, you, you inflict violence upon them, and then you become more and more afraid of what they're going to do in response. And, and, and part of the point I was trying to get to in my essay was to try to rethink the, the relation that we don't, that we, that equality and justice may ultimately may serve the cause of Jewish safety better than unjust power. Yusuf, do you want to respond to that or? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I know there's lots of questions and we want to get to that, but I feel like this is an important um, point to dig into a little bit. I mean, I hear that, Peter. I think, um, I think the question is how, how, how do we not fall in the trap of making this conversation about Jewish security and Jewish safety, which are of course important things, um, without you know without undermining the fact that there is a real lack of security and a lack of safety for Palestinians right now. There has been, and it has been the product of this process called Zionism, right? And so um, you know, I I think that with with there needs to be a way to talk about the safety and security of all people moving forward in whatever it is that 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 is constructed in a shared in a in a shared political system. Um, I get that. What I'm concerned about is in this conversation that um, you are having with 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 others in the in the Jewish community, is that it would be a missed opportunity for introspection about what Zionism has meant for Palestine. Um, and I, I think that is a really important part of us moving forward, uh, because if it's only about, or primarily about, one community's self-interest, um, it's going to be very hard to ever move move the ball uh, forward. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that, and I know there's going to be a lot more question and conversation on this. So I I actually have a follow up for Peter on that, which is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, early Zionism, I mean, American Jewish interaction with early Zionism included this sort of skepticism and sense that you couldn't treat a minority population on the ground without rights that would violate our own values and reflect, be dangerous for, for Jews in the diaspora who are minorities. It was, it was a values issue, right? It was a values proposition. And I know from my time working in the, the Jewish world on this issue, 
uh, certainly since Oslo, the framing has always been in terms of self and self-interest. You make peace because it'll make Jews safer. You make compromises because it'll allow Israel to retain its Jewish democratic character, the demographic argument. There's been a, a really, I say gradual, but at this point it's a decisive shift from any arguments about doing something because it is morally right or because of international law. Those are seen as naive arguments. And I, you know, we're always told the only arguments that work are the self-interest arguments. And, and one could argue that today it's pretty clear they're not working in terms of you know, what you said, you know, motivating people to get up and push for change. Um, how do you start bringing those back in and melding them? There's always going to be a self-interest, but how do you meld those things together? I mean, this is something I really struggle with constantly, and I struggled with it in writing the piece. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons that I think it's so important that Palestinians always be in the conversations, because in terms of the, the point that Yusuf ended with about talking about what Zionism and, and uh, the Israeli state has meant to Palestinians, the best people to make those just arguments and, and tell that story to Jews are Palestinians, right? Who can talk from their own experience. Um, um, and, and so that's why it's so crucial for those voices to, to have greater exposure. I think that um, the, you, you're right, that a, a, language of, a language only of self-interest is very quickly can become a language that is completely amoral. Right, um, and you saw the kind of you know one example of the the consequences of this with with the notion of separation when if Victor Lieberman basically said, okay, well, fine, if your notion is that we're basically the reason to we're going to have a Palestinian state is to maintain a Jewish majority, then surely we should get rid of some of the Palestinian citizens in Israel so we can enhance the majority, right? I mean, he took that long language of self-interest, that amoral language of self-interest, and took it to its logical extreme, which was a kind of ethnic cleansing. Um, so that's entirely right. On the other hand, um, I do believe that um, I see the Jewish people as uh, my extended family. I, I believe that we are, uh, the, the notion of peoplehood is, is very, very important to me. And so I, I have to find a language to talk about the, the welfare and the historic trajectory um, of our people. Um, while also while while never while trying never to allow that to lapse into an excuse for dehumanizing Palestinians or denying them equality and justice, and for me this tension again you know this tension is built right into the center of Jewish texts. I mean the Torah does not belong does not start with Jews; it starts with universal human beings, um, um, and then the book of Genesis becomes the story about the, the creation of a family that becomes the Jewish people. So this tension for me is always present in the work I do, and um, I don't always get it right. But it's a kind of it's a struggle for me always, and I think to and I think that um, it's part of the reason that. Um, I do think that um, there, there are, there's a language that one uses inside one's own community um, that can be different than the language one uses more broadly, but it's always crucial, no matter who one is speaking to, even behind closed doors, even in a Jewish space, that, that, one, that one is always fighting against the dehumanization that is so present in this conversation. Thank you. Um... Yusuf, I want to come back to something we were talking about a little while ago, which is, you know, the, well, taking, t picking this up on some of the questions in the, in the queue. The arguments have been made that critics, as said Peter's, you know, the talk about two states is utopian, it's unrealistic, and I want to get to that in a second. But one of the arguments that is made is, A, if there were a one state shared solution, it would be even more violent, and B, that progressives, like, Peter or even me are, you know, somehow naive to think that Palestinians would ever accept Jews really living in a shared state. And looking at the the historic historical grievances of Palestinians in Palestine, there's that question of, well, is this, you know, sort of a fake out and a trick? Why would? And part of this, I think, speaks to people thinking, if it were me, I wouldn't compromise. <laughs> so why would they? I don't believe in that they would. So can you just take that and run with that for a second? Yeah, you know, it's uh, the, the late Tony Judd before he passed away uh, dealt with this issue, I think, pretty effectively in an interview when someone was asking him about 
uh, the article that he wrote on the alternative, uh, you know, one state equal rights back in 2003. And I think this was in 2010, 11 or so. Um, and, you know, his response was, look, why, why should the Palestinians trust living in one state with uh, Israelis after the history that they've been through? Um, you know, I think we can easily turn that, that question around. Um, I, I think we, when you, when you peel back the layers of these arguments about inevitable violence, um, there's very little left there but some Orientalist racist notions that are lurking uh, uh, around. Um, there is no reason to believe uh, unless you believe that there is something innately violent or anti-Jewish about Palestinians uh, or Arabs and Muslims more broadly. There's no reason to believe either by uh, historic evidence in the region or the rest of the world that if um, treated fairly and in an equal society, uh, that they would be any more uh, prone to conflict or violence than anyone else. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's really what it ends up coming down to as um, uh, an attempt not to have this conversation about equal rights, about a shared society. Um, and, you know, I, I think in, this has been a response that we've seen from a number of pieces to this is that, you know, multi-ethnic states don't work. Well, that's just not empirically true. Um, when, you, when, you look at, when you look at the world that we live in, we have 5,000 some odd ethnicities and 200 different states. Um, you know, a little math will tell you that these states are all multi-ethnic states. And conflict is not uniquely present in multi-ethnic states or not. Conflict is the product of a lot of different things. Um, most of the time, it's about politics and, and the politics of inequality. Um, and so when, when, you look at the, when you look at the research, and I'm glad that, that, that Peter has cited some of that, um, it's really the absence of equality that generates conflict more than, than anything else. So I think the onus is on those who are making this claim to provide some evidence other than, well, it's the Middle East, uh, to suggest that somehow it's, um, it's, it's going to be violent. So picking up on that, we have a question in the queue here, um, which I'm going to give to Peter. Yusuf, you're welcome to comment as well. Um, the question is saying, so given that you have extremist militants on both sides, let's be clear, who are not apt to surrender hegemonic views for the sake of equality and justice and are comfortable using violence to interrupt peacemaking or any kind of new status quo, how would a one state uh, reality survive? I mean, assassination, suicide bombings, all of these challenges. And, and what happens to, in your mind, Peter, to the IDF? Does it disband itself? Does it become a shared, a joint military force with equal numbers? Um, I mean, there's a lot of questions in the queue about these sort of concrete nitty gritty. So I wanna, I wanna start into that a little bit. Right, and I, I can say that I, you know, I have not, I did, I have not, nor did I try to lay out a, a, a blueprint that would answer this, all the specific questions of how such a system would work. There actually has been a, a fair amount of literature on going into detail on some of these particular questions, some of which I, I link to in my piece. Um, I think that the, um, you know, in, in the the question of the military would depend a little bit on whether you're talking about one state or a confederate. But I think you're in some form or another, you're going to basically talking about, about creating military and police forces that, in, that involve both Jews and Palestinians. And that that's, while that, you know, it may be that in certain, in certain regions of the country or certain neighborhoods, maybe the police kind of force that you want to be policing the neighborhood Barak is not exactly the same as the policing force that you want to be policing in Gaza in the sense is that there's a natural value to having people who come from a community policing that particular community. But the larger principle, I think, of equality has to feature in all different institutions. And yes, it's very, very difficult for many people to imagine how that might work right now, but I would just I think it's worth remembering that there was a time when it was for, for most white Americans, certainly most white Southerners, it, the idea of, of, of white soldiers serving under black officers in the American military was unthinkable, right? Not even 100 years ago, it was unthinkable. Um, so 
things become possible, transitions of consciousness are possible um, when people lay out a vision and a movement articulates them. And um, I think in terms of kind of spoilers and people who would fight on, on both sides, I think what we've seen is, I mean, again, there are lots of differences in Israel, Palestine, and South Africa, but you know, the, there, were, there were, for instance, far extremist Afrikaner and white holdouts fighting against the prospect and threatening violence against uh, right up until the, virtually the days before the first free election in 1994. But ultimately, they were marginalized and they were controlled and the center held because there was a movement that allowed for the creation of a political leadership um, that, that had bought in on both sides to the notion of equality, and it was able to come to a political consensus that was so powerful and so broad that even though there were spoilers, there were spoilers like Gachabutalezi, the leader of Inkata, um, uh, there were spoilers like the Volksfront, the kind of radical Afrikaner group, and they were ultimately marginalized because the vast majority of people on both sides ultimately came to the view that this was a better future for them. Great. Um, we have a ton of questions in the queue, so I am basically looking through them and combining them, and so I ask people's patience. I also want to let people know we will be sharing all the questions. We'll print them off or, or take them and copy them so that um, the panelists both have them to inform their own thinking, knowing what people are interested in. Um, so, so please do keep submitting questions. Yusuf, we have a question in the queue specifically about the right of return. Um, so this person is basically asking, given that Israel destroyed hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages in 1948, and those areas, have, those places have been largely replaced by Israeli development and Jewish inhabitants, and I would add this applies even to the West Bank when people talk about starting from today and living together in the West Bank, you know, settlements were established on Palestinian land to a dispossession of Palestinians under Israeli military rule. H how does a one state practically absorb Palestinian refugee population that has grown now to many millions? Do all of them want to go home? Are they allowed to go home? And where do they go back if they can't go to their original homes? And what happens to the millions of Jews, some of them you know, generations descended, who are living there um, now in, in an area which has to absorb them? And how does, how does this manage, how do you manage this politically, economically, spatially? Um, I think the short um, answer to this question is through a process. Uh, this is not uh, something that happens with the, the flick of a switch. Um, this is something that has to be uh, very well uh, thought out and implemented, um, not just in a way that, that furthers historical justice for Palestinian refugees, but also keeps in mind economic sustainability uh, as well. Um, and, you know, I would reference people to the work of the Badil Resource Center, which has done uh, a ton of um, uh, thinking and writing on what the practical, practical implementation of a right of return um, can look like, looking at uh, various examples of repatriation models in different places, what worked well, what didn't work well. Um, but I think one of the important things to keep in mind, too, and it was sort of, um, it, it, in the question uh, was a, a little bit inaccurate is, is this idea that, um, uh, you know, the, yes, the majority of the territory was taken from Palestinians, the majority of their villages were erased, but that majority of that territory remains uninhabited today. Um, so the idea that, um, you know, uh, this is not possible because there's uh, literally people living in all of this space, that's just not true. The vast majority of the land of the villages is not currently uh, inhabited. Um, so uh, are there places where uh, repatriation um, or, or some version of it gets more complex? Absolutely. Um, but that's not the, the, the bulk of the cases. And that's not the only complication with this too, right? There are plenty of other complications as well, but it's not impossible. Um, and it's, it's, as I said, is a process that takes time and has to be done uh, properly with a vision not just to historical justice, but economic sustainability uh, as well, um, because you need to be able to not just repatriate people, but ensure that they can be integrated into a society on a fair economic footing uh, and be restored. Um, not just not just in place, but also um, economically as well. 
Um, so I would definitely recommend people check out the information that's that's the work that's done by the deal um, and a really good uh, podcast uh, interview with uh, Lubna Shomali, uh, who was on a 972 podcast a few weeks ago that discussed this very question. Yeah, I, I echo both of those recommendations. Um, Yusuf, I want to stick with you here. So we have a couple questions in the queue, at least. They're, they're coming in faster than I can, I can read them all. Um, so many Palestinians in America support a one-state solution. Uh, this questioner, who is Palestinian, says most of their family and friends based in Palestine do not support a one-state solution. And what does it mean to transform the discourse in Palestine to make one state more mainstream? And also, uh, a corollary question, someone's asking you, Peter, can you speak about the desire articulated by some Palestinians for full self-determination in their own state, even if it's a fraction of historic Palestine, saying that that still be preferable to power sharing with Israelis? And then the last question I'll add to this is the question of whether or not there are any Palestinian leaders, um, national leaders, leaders on the ground, who are calling for one state at this point. Um, do you want me to start off with that? Um, Those are all for you. That's a, that's a packet of questions for you to address as you wish. So, I mean, I think, you know, uh, you have to keep in mind that Palestinians living on the ground today are living in a one state reality. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if that is your frame of reference for what one state is, why would you support it? Right. Um, and they live in a context where their political leadership has not articulated a vision of a real one state alternative. Right. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that people are skeptical uh, of the situation when their, their only reference to it is the, the impossible situation that they're currently living in. Um, and obviously, Palestinians who are um, living in the diaspora have a number of, of reasons from their own experience to support um, uh, a different vision, including their own experiences with multiculturalism and democracy and so on and so forth in other contexts, right? Um, and also part of it is probably because they want to be able to go home, right? And, and, and be able to live there um, in, in, in freedom and, and equality. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's really what um, it comes down to, um, is that if you, had a, if you had a leadership in Palestine today that was making a case for a one-state alternative that looked different than the one-state reality that we have today, I think the public is very much movable, you know? And, and the other thing too I would caution here is that, um, and the question sort of un understood this, is that, uh, you know, we keep talking about public opinion of Palestinians, um, and we always cite public opinion of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and of course, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza are part of the Palestinian, um, community as much as any other segment of Palestinians. But we often forget about Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinian refugees, those in the diaspora, and so on, um, where there are many different multifaceted views about what um, a future could look like. Thank you. Um, so Peter, again, I'm going to put a couple questions together that are in the queue. Um, we have a question about, uh, I'll phrase it, beyond the moral argument for a single unitary democratic state, you have also made an argument regarding feasibility, in effect saying two states is dead and one state offers the only morally coherent path forward. And the questioner says, well, what if this doesn't inspire mass enthusiasm? And why is this vision, which, as you have said, would require an act of radical imagination, more feasible in your mind than a two-state solution today, which requires actually the very same kind of transformational political will to be achieved. Um, and I'd add to that another question which talks about this idea, if the lack of mutual security for Palestinians and Israelis is directly linked to the inequality of the current situation, this person is asking if whether or not there is, some, it is not maybe necessary that there be a way station on the way towards equality that goes through Palestinian sovereignty. In essence, not saying it has to be two states forever as an impossible status quo, but two states as a path towards whether it's confederation or federation, but needing to first meet at eye level and then move on together to that federation or confederation, which would be binational states. Um, you can run with those two. 
Sure. Look, I, I, um, you know, I was a supporter of the two-state solution for for a very long time. Um, I think that the, um, but I, it's important to remember that um, in the Jewish community, when we talk about two states, we are often talking about something very different than what most Palestinians mean by two states. We have built in certain assumptions into two states that I think are in some ways make it seem like the two state solution would accomplish things, would, would do things that most Palestinians would not want or be happy for it to do. So for instance, when in the Jewish community, when people talk about two states, they generally mean minimal, if any refugee return, right? They mean uh, a state that is given over at least some, if not a lot of its sovereignty to Israel, right? And they mean that, that the creation of a Palestinian state means that Palestinians stop challenging the existence of a Jewish state, right? As far as I can read Palestinian opinion, even among those Palestinians who support two states, those are not the assumptions that they have bought into, right? The polling overwhelmingly shows that Palestinians do not support restrictions on their sovereignty, right? That, for, that Palestinian, the Palestinian national movement has thought about two states in addition to refugee return, right? And even those Palestinian leaders in Israel, who like the leaders of the joint list, who support a two state, don't want Israel to be a state that privileges Jews over Palestinians, right? So even in two states, the Palestinian national movement as expressed by Palestinian citizens would still push for Israel within its 67 lines to be a state for all its citizens, which would be a state that did not favor Jews over Palestinians. I, I say all those things just to show that, that the, the, the two-state solution itself, even if people say that there is a consensus about two states, or there was a consensus, I think it's slipping away now, meant very, very different things uh, to in, in the mainstream Jewish discourse and in Pal Palestinian discourse, by and large. And so what we, I think, if, if it's, it's um, and what I think is, has, so could, even if you had created a Palestinian state, many of these issues would still still be very much unresolved. That's why I say in my piece that I think that the best case one could have made for a two-state solution would have been that it could have been a step towards resolving this conflict. But there would have been many, many deeper issues that would have been out, left outstanding. And in the worst case, it would have simply been a pause before the resumption of hostilities because those deeper issues would not have ultimately been addressed. Um, and so I think it's a, the danger is that, is that for, for too many Jews, two states equals basically the preservation of a Jewish majority in perpetuity, when that's not what it means or has meant for most, most Palestinians. Um, I, the reason, again, I said this before, but the, the reason that I think that um, an, a vision based on equality and inter integration is more compelling um, is because, you know, Frederick Douglass famously said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Um, so the question is, how does that demand get made? How does the balance of power shift? Uh, Israel is an enormously powerful state, economically, geopolitically. What is there on the other side of the ledger that could balance that power? And I think it has to be a mass movement, uh, both on the ground and around the world, and very much including in the United States. And I just, I think that there is a cadre of people who support the idea of separation for kind of pragmatic grounds because it's been the option that's always been there. But I, again, I can just say as someone who speaks about this for myself, even in Jewish audiences, it is not a powerful and rousing vision that I think will be able to lead people to kind of make the sacrifices and do the organizing that will be necessary to shift this balance of power. Thank you. Um, going back into the queue, Peter, I want to stick with you for a second. And I want to dig in a little bit on the question of apartheid. Um, we have some questions in the queue about Michal Svard's opinion that was issued last week, saying that it is impossible to not conclude that the situation in the West Bank already is apartheid. Um, and there's a question in the queue um, about, in your piece, you use the word colonial three times. This person has done a careful analysis, and you only refer to British colonial rule of Palestine. And the question is why you sort of shy away from using a colonial analysis to, to look at what's happening today and to use a 
decolonization analysis to talk about where things need to go. Um, and I'll add that this person uh, is recommending, and I think it's an important recommendation for everyone, that people read Palestinian women analysts, intellectuals, and thinkers. And we have a list of those on the resource page that my colleague has put up in the chat. So people should take a look at that. There is tremendous analysis coming up. Uh, so Peter, if you could wrestle with those for a second. Well, I'm not actually sure that I uh, entirely agree about the piece. I think that, uh, that I, for instance, I quoted Zev Jabotinsky um, uh, talking about Palestinian resistance to colonialism um, as a kind of a natural reaction. Um, and he was not only talking about British colonialism, he was talking about, uh, about Zionist colonialism. Right. I mean, the, the, this was colonialism was not a dirty word for for, for many Zionists in the early 20th century. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important for us to hold as Jews, or I'll certainly say for myself, is to say is to be able to say two things at once. Um, the first is that as many again Zionist leaders recognize themselves, there were colonial features. To the to, to the to the Jewish to the Zionist movement's desire to facilitate mass emigration and then the creation of um, of, a, of a Jewish state or even at least kind of Jewish autonomy um, in Israel Palestine uh, that that, it, that there were that there were kind of there were many colonial features to this right it was done with the very, very important support of the world's most powerful colonial empire, the British Empire, right? Which had declared its support for a national home in the Balfour Declaration. It was filled with notions of progress and civilization, uh, which were typical of that colonial discourse. And it also, also involved, most dramatically, um, uh, during, uh, in 1947 and 1948, the dispossession of Palestinians from the land, um, which was something that, we, again, we saw, we've seen in other settler colonial societies. I think one of the reasons, of course, one of the reasons that it is very difficult for Jews to, many Jews to feel comfortable with that language today is that unlike 100 years ago, now the term colonial is a, is a kind of negative term, whereas when it was used by Zionists 100 years ago, it was considered a positive term. But I think the other reason that it's very difficult for many Jews to use that language is it, it seems to, it is, we, it, see, it would seem to suggest that wherefore we have no authentic connection to this place, right? That we are just the equivalent of the, the British in Kenya. And I don't believe that. I believe that one can simultaneously say that the Zionist movement had settler colonial features and also say, you know, that, that, that there is a very, very deep and real historic Jewish connection to what we call the land of Israel. That's not made up. That's not invented. When I, when I prayed this morning, I prayed a liturgy, which Jews have been praying every single morning for, for, for hundreds, if not, if not more than a thousand years, which talks about Jerusalem and Zion. That's not made up, right? So I don't think that talking about settler colonialism means that we need to deny our deep belief that we are a people that have deep roots in this land. I think we can hold both of those things at the same time. Thanks. And again, Yusuf, feel free to weigh in. <laughs> yeah, if I could jump in here. I, um, I, I think, Peter, you're right. I mean, obviously, I uh, would not doubt in any way the connection of, of, of Jewish people historically to the land. And I think, you know, the, the, the point regarding colonialism, um, the, the founders of Zionism, also understood that, right? Uh, it's it's the it, they defended it though. Um, you know they they said very clearly we are involved in a colonial project, um, and um, they identified the the inhabitants of the land, the Palestinian Arab inhabitants of the land, as the indigenous people, uh, and they tried to make the argument that their colonization of the territory was actually going to be for the benefit of the, the people there, right? Because they were coming to, you know, quote unquote, civilize us and, and raise our economic status. And um, funny how that, you know, all worked out. Um, but, you know, I think one can hold this idea that the Jewish people have a connection to the land, a historic connection to the land that cannot and should not be denied. And also that Zionism was a settler colonial process, not just in the 
writings of Jabotinsky or Herzl. But in the implementation of Zionist policy and then Israeli state policy at every stage of its interaction with Palestinians. And one can draw a historical trajectory from, uh, you know, Gershon Shafir goes back to the second Aliyah, right? And you can draw a line from there through the creation of the state, through the internal colonization uh, of the Israeli state up until 1966, then into the occupied territory of a, a single settler colonial framework that explains the relationship of Zionism to Palestinians. That's the, that's the stuff that I feel like we can and must unpack, we can and must acknowledge, and can easily do so without saying, right, decolonization means Jews don't have a connection to the land, which is simply not true, right? It, it means acknowledging that settler colonialism had this disastrous impact on the indigenous population, and we need to find a way to repair it. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, sticking with you for a second, we have a, several questions in the queue about Palestinians in the West Bank. And one of the questions is, you know, what can Palestinians living in the West Bank do to organize and work towards ending Israeli occupation within the context of the current situation? Um, I'm not sure if that's something you want to take, and I will add that there are amazing resources out there. Go to our resource page as a start and get linked up with some of those great think tanks and other people producing intellectual capital. Um, but they're asking you about that, Peter and uh, Yusuf. And also, um, can you say more about other Palestinian populations that you mentioned previously that are outside the West Bank and Gaza? And talk about the political positions and possibilities for political incorporation among Palestinian citizens in Israel, Palestinians in Lebanon and Jordan, and U.S. and in the broader diaspora. Yeah, I mean, just to, to start with the first question, I think one thing that Palestinians in the West Bank and, and Gaza, and also inside Israel, uh, are doing every single day to challenge the status quo, and those living under military occupation are, 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 are doing this even more significantly, is to continue to exist there. Um, on a daily basis. The, the, the everyday um, uh, resistance um, by persisting as a, a people under those conditions um, is some of the most um, important form of resistance that Palestinians can, um, can undertake. Uh, the, the reality is that between the river and the sea today, there is nearly as many, um, if not, you know, uh, you know, exactly as many uh, Palestinian Arabs as there is uh, Israeli Jews. Um, the, the steadfastness of uh, Palestinians um, to, throughout this period um, is, you know, a, 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 a clear, clear evidence of the failure of the settler colonial project to, to erase them. And that is really, really, really important. Um, uh, so, you know, there's obviously a, a lot of other things we can talk about in terms of ways that people can be uh, involved, but I also think it's important to keep um, in context um, what different, how different people are struggling in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, to, to the other question, you know, one of the, one of the most common sort of um, themes in different partition plans uh, throughout history right? Whether we're talking about 37 or 47 or, or the, the modern iteration of the two-state solution um, has been this um, uh, need to um, dismember the Palestinian population. Um, always looking at the Palestinian population as something that could easily be split up um, into various territories. It doesn't really matter where they go. It doesn't really matter if there is no cohesion between them, no territorial cohesion between them, because the, those supporting these initiatives have never really understood the Palestinian people as a people. Whereas for the Jewish people, for the Zionist project, the effort was always made to ensure that, even with the latest iteration of, of the two-state solution, that within the Jewish state, as many Jews as possible are included. 
that that was never afforded to Palestinians. Um, and so in, in, in my discussion on this, I always try as much as possible to push back on any attempt to divide Palestinians or to not understand them as a cohesive people, even though they are experiencing, you know, different facets of um, this, this system in different ways. Thank you. I think we have time for two more rounds of questions, so we're going to go pretty quickly here. So sticking with you, Yusuf, um, do you think the recent attention to annexation by U.S. policymakers, at least Democrats, is opening up or will open up a dialogue that, that actually allows activists to leverage questions of equality and justice um, and make a change in U.S. policy? Or do you think that this is really just sort of part of the, the noise and it's not actually going to change anything? Um, maybe, maybe not. I kind of lean towards the, it may not change anything um, from, from what I've seen so far. Um, if you're drawing a line at annexation because the threat annexation poses is to, um, you know, the, the ability to keep talking about two states, um, then it's not really going to, to, to change very much. Um, but if, you know, you, you you're drawing a line on annexation because of what it actually means for Palestinians, then maybe it's, it's a different story. Most of what I've seen in sort of the, um, you know, in, in the policy space and by those, um, uh, you know, elected officials who have chosen to, to say much about it has been within the, the former frame. Um, it is that annexation forecloses on a two-state solution, therefore it's bad for Israel, therefore it's bad, right? Um, and this is and, and, and this is why, as I said earlier, it doesn't just matter that you come up with the right answer, but how you got there, right? Um, and it, it matters that you understand this not only as something that uh, may be bad for uh, Israel, but that first and foremost, it's bad for uh, Palestinians. So I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm, it's, I'm glad to see in the discourse that there is a, a greater normalization of accountability. Um, uh, and discussion around that has increased um, because of some of these um, uh, threatened steps that the Israeli government is going to take towards annexation. Um, but unless we understand why it's a problem, uh, it can have the opposite effect. And I, I, I'm very concerned that, you know, um, we, we draw a line around conditioning aid on annexation, um, you know, make, make that a red, a red line, and in doing so, give the status quo a, a green light. Um, that's that would be a, a horrible outcome, and not not something that we uh, we want at all. So, Peter, I want to come back to you with a question, um, which I think is something that is troubling a lot of people. You and I both know, and this is that you know the the anti-occupation advocacy out there already is is deeply subdivided um you know where you are on the left on this and how ready and willing you are to be to fight or be tough what is the strategy to ensure that the sincere advocates for a just two-state solution even if you think they're mistaken um that that doesn't end up part of the opposition to a solution rather than those who just are trying to sustain the status quo i mean how do you how do you go about enlarging the coalition that sincerely is working towards justice and equality, um, maybe agnostic of whether it's one state, two state, rather than making it, okay, if you're for two states, then you can't stand for equality and justice. How do you avoid that, that formula? Well, I, I do think for, you, can, you can try to build a coalition um, um, around the question of American military aid, for instance, um, even among people whose ultimate visions may be different. Um, but all of whom could come to agree that um, there will be no movement in the in the direction of equality and justice um, unless Israel's incentive structure changes, um, and unless Israel faces um, faces face you know pays a price for the consequences of its behavior, not a price that's not a price in violence, but a price in. Um, a, a, a price in, 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 in international relationships. Um, um, and and um, that, you know, that's, that's something where I think, I think there has been movement on this conversation. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, the conversation, we're just moving, we're just beginning potentially to get back to a conversation about the legitimacy of, of conditioning American military that was fairly normalized 
up and you know through the 19 uh, 70s and 1980s, um, including, you know, under presidents like Ronald Reagan. And, and it's really been a kind of a, a, a peculiar feature of this most, this recent period of American history since the early 1990s, that it is, since, since George H.W. Bush was the last person to do that, um, that it's been considered kind of so unthinkable for the U.S. to do what I think is legitimate for the U.S. to do with any country that it gives support military or any kind of support to which is to say if we're going to give you support we want you to be pursuing policies that that are in line with american interests and american uh, principles and so i think that that's a, a fight that i think um people can have and that we need to push forward even even though there will be disagreement about ultimate goals and um i think there has been some progress there but i i agree with with yousef which is to say um the the danger is that um people um people see annexation to kind of de jure israeli control as kind of a, a, a as a red line uh, and therefore even they therefore kind of legitimize um the de facto control which exists today the united states should not be complicit in supporting either Thank you. All right. So we have time, I think, for two more questions. Uh, Peter and then Yusuf, I think you're going to get the last word on timing here. Um, Peter, so there's a couple questions in the queue. People would like to hear about how various writers and, and movements have impacted your thinking. And you've talked about Palestinians. Um, I think there's interest a little more in, in your thoughts on the BDS movement, how that's impacted your thinking, but also Jewish American groups um, like JVP and If Not Now. Right. So um, I, you know, I've been kind of fortunate to to know people in both, you know, if not now and JVP um, and um, have friends, you know, in both organizations and have been, um, you know, and have been uh, inspired by their activism on on these issues, even when I haven't always agreed on every single issue, um, just like I've also been, um, you know, uh, I've been very, I think J Street has done really important things, even though I haven't agreed with J Street and everything, and obviously don't see eye to eye with J Street on this question of, of one state or, or kind of equality right now versus, versus separation. Um, I also think that the BDS movement has played an important role in, in bringing a conversation about pressure to bear. Um, and I believe in the idea of nonviolent pressure to change Israeli behavior. Um, I, in the, you know, in terms of signing up to the BDS movement in total, that's something that I really have to, I can't do at this point. It's something that I really have to give more thought to. It would really take um, uh, an entire other essay to really delve really deeply into the question of looking into the history of the BDS movement and all its different factions to try to figure out the ways in which I can, in which what I feel is comfortable and right for me. Um, but I definitely, have been very, very vocal about opposing efforts to kind of criminalize um, uh, b either the BDS movement or anti-Zionism as an ideology. Um, and again, to me, the larger question that I, that I do very much believe in is the importance of putting pressure on Israel, um, nonviolent pressure, such that it changes Israel's incentive structure, such that we try to make the case to Israeli Jews that the status quo is not ultimately, we try to make the status quo not be sustainable. Great, thank you. And Yusuf, I wanna give you the last word with a question that it, it's in the queue in various forms, and it's certainly on my mind, which is, so, you know, pa Peter talked about Palestinians making their case, sharing their stories, but you know, this is something that, that's happened and, and it, hasn't, it hasn't broken through and it hasn't broken through to change people's thinking. What do you think is the responsibility for progressives and particularly progressive Jews in terms of challenging and fixing the demarginalization of Palestinians in, in this space? Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, the analogy to the, the anti-mannel campaigns. You know, you can't, like, I refuse to be on any panels if there are, if I'm, if I'm the only woman. I mean, if you're not, I, I won't attend panels where there aren't women. I mean, is there, is there something that, that needs to just become part of the, the, the fabric of how all of us as responsible analysts, progressive or others, deal with this issue um, that needs to be really um, changed in how, how this discussion takes place, new rules of engagement. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer is, is pretty simple. We need to see Palestinians, we need to hear Palestinians, and we need to center Palestinians in the conversation. There should not be conversations about Palestinians without Palestinians. It's, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I think, you know, we also, we also need to, to look at how all of those conversations have taken place in the past often. And this is one of, uh, you know, my sort of biggest um, concerns about what the, the, you know, quote unquote evolution uh, of, of liberal Zionism has been over the last, you know, couple decades is that it has taken up a certain adversarial space in the discourse. Um, that has further marginalized Palestinians in many ways. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen mainstream debates about Israel policy uh, that have included two sides and neither of them were Palestinian, right? Um, yeah. that, that stuff's gotta stop uh, and it's gotta stop yesterday, you know? Um, so we need, we, we, uh, and, 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 and I think we, we, need, um, we need allies to do that work. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that Palestinian Americans are already doing uh, and struggling just uh, to be heard, and it is already an uphill climb. Um, and and non-Palestinian allies who um, uh, truly believe in equality and justice um, need need to do all they can to elevate Palestinian voices and and center them in conversations. I think that's a great place to stop. And I will say that that is something we are seeking to model at the foundation of Jewish Currents is seeking to model that. Certainly Peter is modeling that in how he is presenting these articles um, in every discussion I've heard. Um, and we will certainly commit to continuing to do that here. On behalf of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and Jewish Currents, I wanna thank Peter and Yusuf for participating in what has been an extraordinarily rich and, 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 and thought-provoking uh, webinar. Uh, thanks to everyone who attended and who gave us questions. And yes, your questions will be passed on and people will uh, can continue to benefit from them, hopefully. Um, I encourage people to look at our website, www.fmep.org, not as a place to stop, but as a place to start. Um, to look for resources maybe that you are unfamiliar with and, and learn more about Palestinian voices and follow that thread where it takes you. Um, and thanks to all who joined us for this webinar. Uh, check back at our site for a recording of the webinar. It should be online immediately when we end uh, for announcements of other webinars that we are holding and for other information. And with that, we will say goodbye. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.